New Testament survey. I want to begin by giving the outline of the book of Mark, which I neglected to do last time. I'd like to give you outlines of each of the books of the New Testament. You can make your own, but outlines, again, are frameworks to interpret the book. Let's see, Mark, back to your whatever notes you had there. The introduction is chapter 1, 1 to 13. The Galilean ministry, 114 to 950. And uh, I'd like to subdivide that. His public ministry is 114 to 543. The training of the 12, 61 to 950. The journey to Jerusalem, chapter 10. Work and Passion in Jerusalem, 11 to 16. His work and passion in Jerusalem. Now, his passion, of course, means his sufferings and death. That's just a common term used of the class. Work and passion in Jerusalem, 11 to 16. And I want to subdivide that. Final days in Jerusalem, chapters 11 to 13. Passion narrative, 14 and 15. Resurrection, 16, 9 to 13. Well, let's just say 16 through verse 13. Then the commission, great commission, 16, 14 to 20. And as you study the book, you see you have an outline, you... No, the theme of that whole section helps you understand the events in that section. That's the idea. Now let's come to Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. So say the New Testament won't take nearly as long in a survey as Old Testament. Because all the foundations are in the Old Testament. Moreover, you're much more familiar with the New Testament. Luke, the purpose of the gospel. Each writer, as I said, had a purpose. And Luke's purpose is set forth in the first four verses, if you want to turn there. Purpose is set forth in Luke 1, 1 to 4. Now, before we read it, if you want to write the purpose, it is so that his friend Theophilus might know the certainty of the things which he had heard by the hearing of the ear. His purpose in writing this gospel, he writes it to a friend, to one man, is that he might know the certainty of those things that he'd heard orally by word of mouth. And notice, that's what he says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, now here's his purpose, seem good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that's a Greek name for a man, his friend, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So this is the only gospel written by a Gentile to a Gentile, and it became uh, one of the most uh, beloved in in the Bible and uh, found a place in the Bible. So that's his purpose. Now we look at some special characteristics of it which help you interpret. Luke is mentioned three other times in the New Testament. That's unusual for a writer to have his name in three other places. But in Philemon 24, Paul calls him a fellow worker. means he was with Paul. Philemon 24. In Colossians 4.14, He called him the beloved physician. You know what the non-charismatics have done with that one. 
He had to have Luke along because he had all that eye trouble and all those infirmities from so many imprisonments and stonings and starving himself to death and shipwrecks. And, and I used to teach that, but when I got the baptism and then read Acts again, I noticed that Luke never mentions ever a physical medical healing. He only records miracles. Whenever there's a healing, it's supernatural. Second Timothy 4.11, he says, only Luke is with me. Now, if you're real sharp, he's mentioned somewhere else. Where? Somebody said it. X. But his name's not there. How do you know he's there? Yeah, he starts out the book of Acts when we get to it by say, referring to Luke, you know, the gospel that we know he wrote. And he says, this is just a continuation of that. I'm going to give you the history of the church now. And then in chapter 13, verse 13, he's, he, everything's in the third person up to then. And this is where he gets converted in Troas, and he starts saying, then we did so and so. And so this is when they're in Troas, and of course, you can put two and two together. He was a convert of Paul's in Troas, and because of his, uh, not medical skills, but because of his help, his ability, he was a scholar, uh, like Paul was. He'd be a fitting companion in the ministry, and was of much help to Paul. In fact, the medical idea, there's not one reference and Paul is always boasting about Luke, his fellow worker and companion. And only Luke is with me. Why, why didn't he go on and say, and uh, thank God for Luke, because I'd have never made it without Luke <laughs> and his pills and his medical instruments. It'd been a good time to set it, wouldn't it? I mean, it's an argument from silence, but it's a good one. So I've already said he's the only Gentile author. His name is Gentile. It's Greek, Luke. Now let's look at some characteristics of the book, things that stand out in this gospel that distinguish it from the others. Remember, we have four gospels, not just for the sake of repetition, but they each do a job. Matthew is written to Jews. It's placed first in our New Testament, not because it's written first, because it's the only one of the four that links the Old with the New Testament. It's filled with quotations of thus it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And he wrote his gospel to the Jews. He gives a Jewish genealogy, for example. He starts with Abraham. He doesn't go back to Adam, the Gentile. Adam wasn't a Jew, I guess you know. Abraham's the father of the Hebrew race. And that's interesting. Luke goes back to Adam, you see. So he's writing to a Gentile. All right, some characteristics. It's the longest one. <laughs> That's profound, but uh, you probably never noticed that. The reason that I emphasize it, I had to be able to sight read it in Greek to pass my doctoral exam. I could sight read it. I could, past tense. <laughs> I remember Luke, 24 chapters. I always wonder why they didn't pick Mark, only 16. But I, th I was thankful I was majoring in Old Testament. Old Testament, you have to translate anything in the Old Testament, you see, to pass a doctrinal exam. But if I were majoring in New Testament, I'd have to sight read the New Testament. So I was thankful they stuck with, with an Old Testament student. They limited you, you know. You only had to know everything about Luke in Greek. <laughs> well, anyway, it's the longest of the four. It's characterized by much poetry, especially, do you see that in chapters 2 and 3? You have the record, you know, of Mary's prophecy and Elizabeth's prophecy and the father of John the Baptist, his prophecy. And you don't get it in the English, but in the Greek, these are all poetic prophecies. In fact, prophecy is generally poetic. That's how you can tell it in Greek or Hebrew. It goes into an, another meter or form. And uh, it's like when you're prophesying here. It's not like you're talking. And the higher the gift, the more poetic it is, you see. And so we have, you know, Elizabeth's poem in chapter 1, uh, verse 42, when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
spake out with a loud voice, said, Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And then um, Mary, verse 46, Mary said, and she was anointed to say this, Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and goes on and gives a prophecy. And Zechariah gave one. So Luke is characterized by poetic prophecies that you don't get in the others. One thing that characterizes his gospel is the, the extensive references to the prayers of Jesus. Here's where we get a lot of teaching on how to pray, the prayer of faith, and so forth. You have six different prayers given in Luke from Jesus' lips. He prayed at his baptism, after cleansing the leper, before calling the twelve. He prayed at his transfiguration, and Luke records two times on the cross when he prayed. Six times. Luke gives us the only reference to two parables on prayer in uh, Luke 11 and 18. The friend at midnight where Jesus teaches us how to pray with respect to being persevering and uh, also the unjust judge in Luke 18, which I've had more questions about Luke 18 by people it never occurs to me to raise, raise questions when I got the baptism and heard the message of faith. I said, praise the Lord. God answers prayer. I just started praying and he started answering. Amen. And yet, all over the countries we go around, when you say if you pray ten times with the same promise, you prayed nine times in unbelief, time and again people will come up. Not to debate, but they'll say, what about Luke 18? Some of you are thinking, what about Luke 18? Luke 18. Now, we don't want to get into that this morning. We're not teaching on prayer, but there's where the woman kept going to the judge until he finally said, lest she weary me, I'll give her her petition. They'll say, see, she kept going. And Jesus teaching on prayer, we should keep going. You know what my answer always is? Jesus gave Luke 18, didn't he? Well, he also gave Mark 11:24. He also gave Matthew 6, and I don't think he would contradict himself. He said, don't use vain repetitions as a heathen do. They think they're heard for the much speaking. He said in Mark 11, 24, when you pray, believe you have received. Well, if you believe you have it, what do you ask him again tomorrow for? Now, he didn't say not to stop holding it before him. I do. But I don't ask but once for his promises. And that's what he's talking about. But as I say, it never occurred to me to bog down in some parable what they're really looking is for a way to get out of having to believe God. See, if I can find a way out and God doesn't answer me, then I can always say, well, see, Jesus said it. The only trouble is he didn't say it. But he gives those two parables on prayer. 11 and 18 is teaching perseverance, persistence, not repetition. And there's a big difference because then he would contradict himself. And we know, and I know, friends, I prayed for 14 years for my mother, and when I got the Holy Ghost, he said, how long are you going to continue to pray for? I got the message. I said, once more, because I haven't been praying in faith, Now I'll ask you in faith. And I claimed her, put her name right on John 14, 14, in Jesus' name. He saved her in 10 minutes. Now, it was months later when he worked it out, but I never asked him again. I just thanked him every time I thought of it. It's done. Praise the Lord. Your word's faithful. She's saved. Whether or not she knows it, she's saved. I've already claimed it. Amen. See, that's praying about it. That's holding it before the Lord. Amen. That's reminding him he's faithful. I'm still praying about it. I'm not asking for it again. And that's what separates the knowledgeable from the typical Christian. Those who are knowledgeable take all that Jesus said. They don't keep a woman from prophesying in the church because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 the women are to keep silence. They take the whole revelation and they see what does he mean by that. Because he himself said in two chapters preceding when she prays or prophesies, do it with the head covered. Well, you have to speak to pray or prophesy. So he can't mean absolutely she can never say a word in the church. You have to see what he's talking about and he tells you. He tells you right there. Go home and read it, what he's talking about. That's right. Then we have in Luke the teaching on total discipleship. That's what I've been accused of being having as my hobby horse. 
Students heard me in college uh, seminary. Uh, every now and then we'd preach in the church too, you know, that went with the seminary. And uh, they heard me once or twice in class and w once or twice preaching, said, well, now I know what his hobby horse is. Total discipleship. Well, I, I could be accused of a lot of worse things. <laughs> That's what Luke 9 and 14 teaches. 9 and 14. Count the cost because it is total discipleship with Jesus. The churches may let you play around with Christianity, but Jesus won't. You better believe it. I won't see some of you in the kingdom if you're following what the churches teach today. But if you'll follow Luke 9 and 14, we'll all make it. Now, I believe you're that way, or you wouldn't be here on Saturday morning learning Hebrew. <laughs> Although, of course, you love Hebrew already, don't you? Well, I, I tell you, I didn't have much love for it the first semester, but when the Lord said, I want you to major in Old Testament, uh, the love came with it. I said, well, if he wants me to do it, then, then I'll start liking him. When it did, I just fell in love with it. I could talk Hebrew at the breakfast table, but don't you bring any of your problems at the breakfast table. But you can come over and ask me about verbs and nouns. and <laughs> Well, I'm not kidding. I mean that. My wife and I discussed prepositions this morning, but if she brings a problem up, which she doesn't anymore, I'll say, <laughs> I'll say look, even the Lord knows that you get ulcers by worrying while you're trying to eat. <laughs> no, a long, many years ago, some of you act like you haven't heard me say it. I've said it many times. Many years ago, we stopped discussing troubles, people's problems, and we, since we don't have any, we don't confess them at the table, and yet I, I'm going to say it, I've been in some of your presence while you eat, and you're still worrying about problems while you eat. You can't do both. Bless your heart. You're going to get the message, some of you. <laughs> the Lord doesn't want you to worry anyway, but not while you eat. It eats the time to talk about pleasant things, spiritual matters. Not that you almost had a wreck, or have you heard what's happening over in such and such a member's home? And it is not the time, friends, and you'll find out that it'll become a joyful time when the family gets together and sit down and eat. I hope everybody's hearing that because... Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. I mean, if we go out to eat, let's go out and enjoy it. Why bring problems. So you can come and talk Hebrew, saying, I could talk Hebrew at the table. All right, so some more characteristics of Luke is the great detail and length that he gives to the infancy narrative, you know, the birth of Jesus in his childhood. Only Luke gives us all this information from chapter 1 through most of chapter 2. We have so little information on Jesus' childhood. You know, Mark jumps right into his ministry because he's not going to emphasize Christmas, you see. <laughs> That's a fact. You see, the, the liberals, the neo-orthodox, teach that the atonement is in the, is in the incarnation, that his birth is salvation. And that is not what the Bible teaches. It's Amen. his death. Amen. And that's what Mark wants to get to. Now, I'm not saying Luke, but that's where they get the Christmas story, friends. Let's face it, Matthew and Luke. I thank God that we have what Luke gave us. But the point is, the writers of the gospel basically are not trying to give you the childhood of Jesus. And Luke doesn't do that. He gives you just a tiny bit of information, but we're thankful we have it. What they're getting to is his ministry, his baptism, his anointing, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. That's the gospel. Now, his birth is important, or there couldn't be a ministry. But look how the devil has perverted that and it's taught in all of your seminaries, with almost few exceptions, that the incarnation is the atonement. That's the way they say it. 
because they deny the substitutionary blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they say his identification with us, he redeemed us. Well, that, he did not redeem us by identification. That enabled him to be able to redeem us by identifying with us as a man. So anyway, he gives a great detail to the infancy narrative. Where would you get uh, such uh, teaching like when he went into the temple and was there listening to the wisdom of the doctors and they marveled at his wisdom? Two days later, his parents discovered he's missing, and they said, why did you do us this way? He said, uh, how is it that you sought me? He says, why were you looking for me? She says, didn't you know I'd be in the temple? Didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? And they, didn't, they understood not the saying which he spake. But where would you get this? And this is why we teach children, be subject to your parents. And here is God himself. He went down with them to Nazareth and was subject to his mother and his father. Amen. The Son of God. Even though he was about his father's business in church, doing what he should do, he obeyed them. And he left and went with them and became subject to them. No, you, you be obedient to your parents. They didn't even understand him, but he, he obeyed them. He was subject to them. And that word means subject. Don't run away from it. Wives, subject to your husbands. Church, subject to your elders. Children subject to your parents. All of us subject to the government. All of us subject to police authorities. The Bible teaches it from cover to cover. There is no power but of God, Romans 13. Whether it's parental, whether it's uh, uh, church, whether it's government, whatever. So all of us, and even Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, is subject to the Father, Paul says. <laughs> Now, that's not in subjection to, like, you know, one is lording it over the other because the Son and the Father are equal, over and over we're told. But somebody has to be over it all. In a church, home, or anywhere, or you're going off in all directions at once. And Paul concludes 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, and says that when, after Christ has reigned and ruled, then he'll deliver the kingdom up to the Father so that everything can be all and all in one, the Father. And he, he will reign with the Father at the right hand, and he says the overcomers will reign with him. Amen. And he says the overcomers will reign with him. Amen. We've got to overcome Amen. to reign with him. You can be saved, but you've got to overcome in all things to reign. You can be saved by overcoming the world by your faith, First John 5. Amen. Then another characteristic of Luke is the genealogy of Christ. In chapter 3, he reverses the order of Matthew. Matthew's only talking to Jews, so he starts with Abraham to prove that Jesus goes back to the father of the Hebrew race and traces him up to the present time. Luke reverses the order of Matthew and starts with Jesus and traces him all the way back to Adam, which is interesting because we must not forget that Jesus didn't begin with Abraham or with Nazareth, that he is called in 1 Corinthians 15, the last Adam. He is, he is a son of Adam by the flesh, descended through David, which uh, gives his Hebrew lineage, but his son of God, of course, at the same time. You see, there's a difference when they get down to uh, the genealogy of Christ. That Matthew traces from Abraham to Jesus. Luke goes from Jesus back. And they give different names at one point. There's a very simple explanation. One traces the genealogy through Mary's lineage, and she was tribe of Judah, which made it authentic, and the other traces it through Joseph, the father. And it's a little bit of a technical study, but it's a satisfactory explanation. All the scholars, I mean conservative students of the Bible, have always held to that. There's no, obviously, again, no contradiction would ever be left two glaring contradictions in the Gospels. Uh, somebody, if, uh, if uh, they were trying to put something over, would just simply straighten out what is the contradiction, but it isn't. We don't always have all the facts at our disposal. In the genealogies, one traces the lineage through Mary, and Luke, being a Gentile, would do that, but no Jew would do it. So Matthew traces it through, through the Father like any Jew would do through Joseph. 
And there's just one point where they give a different name. Well, that's uh, really nothing to get even concerned about. Uh, sometimes you hear mention of the uh, uh, genealogy of uh, Jesus coming through uh, Rahab the harlot. But uh, where do we find that? Uh, we could show you from the Old Testament. That's not just a statement pulled out of the air. But Jesus' lineage does come through Rahab the harlot. Uh, which shows that he is a child of the flesh, just like all of us. While there is a definite lineage when you get to David, and he comes through Shem and not Ham and Japheth and that sort of thing, because Shem maintained the true revelation and so forth. But uh, the Bible paints the picture just the way it is. So it could easily be shown if we want to look up the references. I wouldn't recommend, uh, I appreciate your questions and all, that we bog down on genealogies because Paul himself said don't do it. He says don't, don't get involved in a lot of endless questions about genealogies. If you don't know where that is, go home and look it up in a concordance. And I'm not criticizing anybody, but, but I am saying, dear friends, that... Uh, you can't prove too much between Matthew and Luke, and all we've got is a theory that Matthew followed one scheme and Luke the other, because obviously we're getting saved out of the Bible, we're getting baptized in the Holy Ghost, we're getting healed and we're getting answers to prayer, so it must be accurate what's there. Amen. And so Paul knows that uh, we can get involved in a lot of endless discussions on genealogies. It is all right for your sideline study, but I'm not going to deal too much with it. Now, there are places where it does profit, so as I say, I'm not criticizing uh, to say this, but I don't want to spend much time on it. When we get into the table of the nations, you know, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, then you want to know something about genealogies, but that's a broad picture anyway there, and not a um, who begat who so much. It doesn't mean they're unimportant, because that one in Book of Ruth is quite important. It's a very short one, but it's important. Here's another characteristic of Luke. He gives the Emmaus Road narrative. The Emmaus, E-M-M-A-U-S, Emmaus Road narrative. That's a long narrative. Remember after the resurrection, two disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus, and of they were questioning. They say, well, we thought that Jesus was our Messiah, but he died, and he's over there in a tomb. And they didn't know he'd been resurrected. And it says someone walked up to them, Jesus, in another form. He could disguise himself in his resurrection body and appear as someone else. He said, what are you talking about? And they went through all that, and they were lamenting and crying. He said, oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe all that's written in the law, the prophets, and the writings concerning me concerning the Messiah. He said, didn't you know the Christ must suffer and die and be raised on the third day? He said, die for... Then they asked him to break bread with them, and as he was breaking bread, he revealed himself to them as the one who broke bread at the Last Supper. So only Luke gives a detailed account of that. There are only two verses of it in Mark and nothing in the other Gospels about the road to Emmaus. Then miracles and parables that are peculiar in Luke. We have the miraculous draught of fishes in chapter 5. There have been more sermons preached from that. If you haven't preached sermon, Luke 5, you elders yet, you really have not been in Luke much. That's what the Lord gave me when uh, I was studying the question of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and uh, whether or not I should uh, accept it because I'd had the witness of it and ask for it. I had all the teaching, my own and everybody else's to the contrary. And uh, the Lord, just like I'm talking to you, except inwardly, said, read Luke 5 and preach a sermon on it. And I already had a sermon. That was like 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And tell the people you believe that it's valid for today and you're asking for it. Well, that, that may not sound big to you, but it was big <laughs> nine years ago. <laughs> to our church. And you know what he said? He said, no, you don't know if it's for today. You haven't received it and you've been taught against it, but I want you to launch out in the deep and just tell them everything. You don't have it yet and take a step of faith and then you'll, you'll receive a great draught of fishes. 
Well, that's what I did, and I've had a great, uh, pulled in a lot of fishes since then, in every way. <laughs> Miraculous draw to fishes. Then he, Luke gives the widow's son, raised my dead in chapter 7. We don't have that recorded anywhere. Remember where he happened to pass a funeral on the way and stopped the procession, motorcade, and opened the Cadillac station wagon? <laughs> Said, arise, and out he came. <laughs> now, he didn't stop every funeral. He always had a purpose. He said he did only what his father told him to do. Amen. Then the woman with an infirmity is healed in 13. A man with dropsy healed in 14. These are miracles that he records that are special. A man with dropsy in 14. Ten lepers healed in 17. And then he records that unusual incident that we wouldn't have if he didn't do it in chapter 22 of putting an ear back on a man. Restoration. People say, you believe in restoration? I said, I sure do. The Bible teaches it. <laughs> if he put an ear back upon a man who was trying to crucify him, he'll certainly put one back on you if you believe him. <laughs> you remember when Peter, impetuous Peter, took his sword out of his sheath and lopped off, tried to take off the head of the servant of the high priest, and the, he must have ducked and he <laughs> severed one ear, and Jesus restored it. When I say put it back on, there's no word that picked it up off the ground put it back on. He just touched it and he got a new ear. I imagine that other ear was lying there with the one he had. <laughs> and it's interesting to know these things because... Luke, like Mark and some others, they record things we don't have in other Gospels. But remember what John said in 21-25, if all the things that Jesus did were written in a book, or in books written down, I don't think the whole world could contain them. Now that's hyperbole, which is a term which means it's, a, it's an obvious exaggeration, but the point he's making is uh, obvious too that he did so much that you couldn't have a Bible that would be convenient to carry around, but you would need a library. And God didn't intend we have all of that, but that we have just enough that if we'll believe it, then we can be saved. And enough, of course, to guide our Christian walk. But here we have this case of the high priest's ear, the servant's ear, that isn't the others. Then we have two parables that are characteristic of Luke. Ones that we're always referring to, the Good Samaritan in chapter 10 and the Prodigal Son in chapter 15. Prodigal Son and the Good Samaritan. And then Luke has that very, very important teaching that we use in so many ways in chapter 16 on the intermediate state of the soul. Where is it after death? Without Luke 16, you wouldn't have too much teaching in the New Testament. Very important. You refer to it all the time to prove that, that there's no second chance and to prove that immediately after death the wicked are in Hades and torment and the righteous are with the Lord. Luke 16. Then another significant thing about the Gospel of Luke is the great emphasis given upon the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Now you know what the book of Acts is generally called by Bible students, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And so Luke wrote both. And so his Gospel, like the book of Acts that he wrote, is a great emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Over and over again he stresses this. All right, let me give you an outline of Luke before we leave it. All right, we'll give you an outline to build your study on. Introduction is the infancy narrative, chapters 1 and 2. The infancy narrative, chapters 1 and 2. The Galilean ministry, chapters 3 through 9, 50. 3 through 
And then the travel narrative is 951 through 1814. The travel narrative. You need a road map to follow from 9 to 18. The Judean period, including ministry, would be 1815 through chapter 24, the rest of the book. We can break that last period down in his journey to Jerusalem. Eighteen fifteen to nineteen twenty seven. Final days nineteen twenty eight through chapter twenty one. The Passion Narrative twenty two and twenty three. Resurrection and Commission 24. Of course, only Luke, I, I recall, too, that uh, he's the only one that gives the conversation of both thieves on the cross. Uh, I forget which gospel gives. I think Matthew speaks of the thieves on the cross, but only one, Luke, gives the uh, testimony of faith of the one thief who was converted. where he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, emphasizing that he believed that even though he was dying just like he was, that nevertheless he had a kingdom he was going to inherit after his death. That's the greatest statement of faith in all the Bible to me. Is one man dying, looking at another one dying just like him, and putting his soul into his hands. Well, that, uh, I got a sermon on that, I'll preach it sometime maybe. I think we'll stop there and not try to get into Acts because that's a whole study in itself. And I may try to trace one of Paul's journeys here on the map. So if you can sit up as close as you can, it might help next time. It'll give you a general idea of what Paul was doing, even if you don't see the little names on the map.